Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, our marine ecosystem is a fragile balance of interdependence. Today, efforts to preserve a popular fish species that was nearly lost. Wildcat populations are also at risk. We'll learn what is being done right here in Florida to preserve and protect panthers. And we'll take you to a different kind of dog show where all breeds compete against each other and agility, not pedigree, is what it takes to win. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. Hello and welcome to Animal Outtakes. I'm Marsha Panucci and this is my trusted co-host, Zeus. We begin our show this week with a preservation effort you may not be aware of. This effort is led by our friends at Moat Marine Laboratories. We were there for a very interesting and important event and it all revolved around an extremely crucial part of our ecosystem, a fish called the snook. I'm sure you're asking the same question I had. Why snook? Two, four, six, one. Two, four, two. Two, one, eight. Two, three, eight. Guys, a beautiful snook. Yeah. In Florida, they're a big part of the ecosystem. They're one of the top predators. They're pretty high in abundance right now. So if you can control the top predators and make sure that that population is healthy, things beneath them will be healthy, healthy as well. And it goes the other direction too. You need to make sure that there's a healthy ecosystem out there to support that large population of snook. And if they're doing well, and the fishery's doing well, and people are happy, then we know that we're doing our job as fishery scientists. Moat grows this species as an example of one model species that could be used around the country to help enhance local populations. So today Ryan and his team are releasing snook into the wild to help build and support our local fishery as a preventative measure. Snook support a very important recreational fishery in southwest Florida. The reason that we're growing them is partly to enhance the local snook populations. Snook are at the very northern extent of their range, so they can be subjected to things like a cold stun event, and that can cause a lot of mortality to the snook juveniles that are in the tidal creeks over winter. Our goal is to figure out a, an approach to responsibly stock juvenile snook back into the creeks, so that if nature causes a problem with the population, we may have a tool for management to use to help keep that population sustainable. It may seem magical and mystical, but everything Ryan does serves a specialized function. Every single snook that we release is tagged, so we know that it's a hatchery raised snook. This particular batch of snook has been tagged with passive integrated transponder tags. Is that or this? Pit tags. That's this little thing. <laughs> it's about two centimeters long, and we place it into the Salome cavity of the snook. What this tag does is that out in the creeks we've set up eight different monitoring stations and we'll be releasing these snook at those stations. Those stations have pit tag antenna arrays and what those antenna arrays do there's a wire loop that goes under the water that's powered by some batteries which are recharged with the solar panel so it's completely self-functioning. Every single time one of these tag snook swims over one of those wire loops that this tag, this tag charges and it sends out a little pulse that is recorded on a microcomputer with the number of this tag, when it was there, and which exact loop it was at. And this constant feedback is happening 24-7. This gives the scientists vital information to monitor and manage the health of a fishery. And from this data, they can form a sustainability plan for years to come. It was an amazing experience to witness the release of the juvenile snook into the creek. And who knew that they were such a critical piece of the puzzle? There are five different species of snook right here in Florida, and they all play an important part of our ecosystem. Moat Marine Laboratories is a treasure to have right in our own backyard, and the release we saw today is yet another example of what is being done to preserve and protect 
Florida's wildlife. Well, there you go. Who knew the snook was such an important part of our marine environment? Now on to the point in the show where we take you on an adventure, an animal adventure, and we meet a sulcata tortoise, and get this, a mata mata. Found in the waters in South America, this turtle has a face only a mother can love. But if you look a little closer at the Mata Mata turtle, he will surely make you smile. Uh, one of the reasons that we like to show this guy is because of his face. Oh my goodness. He has a really, really cool head. And from uh, like this, he looks like a leaf. Yes, And he that's does. for camouflage. They'll actually, they're a lot like an, a snapping turtle. So they are very stationary. They don't move around a whole lot. Uh, they'll plant themselves in one spot and they'll just wait for fish to come by. Now, they don't really have a beak like a snapping turtle, so when they bite it, it, it it'll scare you, but it doesn't hurt very much. It's more of the shock of it. Um, but they just swallow their prey whole. So he'll sit there you know, with his head up, and they've got a very long neck too, so they can reach. And you can see his little nose at the, at the end of the little snorkel. Yes, but you know what I can't see? His little eyes. He's got two little eyes. Are they eyes. right there? Yep. Okay, now I can see them. <laughs> They'll actually shed their skin a lot like a snake or, or any reptile for that mm -hmm. matter. So that's where that little slough is coming off. And then it also works as camouflage. It looks like just a soggy leaf laying at the bottom of a river. Now, Andrew, you keep talking about the Mata Mata turtle <coughs> and its smile. Really? Yeah, these guys are known for their smile. They have this, um, they always look like they're smiling. So they call them the happiest turtles there are. How long do these guys usually live? Um, they'll live 30, 40 years. Um, even in the wild, they have a long lifespan. In captivity, you know, with any animal, with proper care and, and diet and stuff, they can live you know, upwards of 50 years. A turtle like the Mata Mata spends most of its life in the water, where a tortoise remains on land. Which brings us to this hefty reptile. Andrew, we have this gorgeous tortoise, mm -hmm. and it is a boy, we know. Yep. And what's always amazing to me are the beautiful markings that are on the shell. But he's really carrying a big load, isn't he? He is. He's a pretty heavy guy. He's an African spur thigh tortoise, or a salcata. Um, and he's about close to 200 pounds, so he's a fairly large male. So what does he eat mainly? Um, he's a grazer, so he eats a lot of grass. Um, we also feed him a little bit of tortoise diet. They like um, flowers as snacks, some different... Mm -hmm. um, be, uh, vegetables like mm -hmm. peppers, things like that. I'm holding two babies. Yes. Right. And this is how they really get started. This is how they come out. So this guy is not even a year old, and then this one is a little over a year. So you can kind of see the size difference in just a year. And you got to figure he's about 30 to 40 years old at his size. And this, is he still growing? He's still growing. See, reptiles, they never really stop growing. They slow way down, but they never stop. So they'll continue to grow for their whole life. Andrew says the Salcata tortoise is one of the most popular tortoises sold in the pet trade. And with a lifespan of about 120 years, they come with a lifelong commitment from potential owners. What do you think about buying a tortoise like this? Well, you know, it's kind of a toss up. If you are dedicated to the animal um, and you, you want a tortoise, you know, that's your passion and you're into them. You know, if you take proper care of them and you do your research and you realize what you're getting into, then yeah, they can, they're, they're non-aggressive. Um, they, like I said, they have longevity. They're fairly easy as far as diet, um, but you just have to take into consideration everything that is, is entailed in caring for these animals. And that's where a lot of times we have the issue is people get them and they don't realize everything that's involved in taking care of them. Up next, wild cats. And you'll get to know our VI Pets of the Week, four lovable gentle giants, the Bull Mastiffs, when we return. For thousands of years, we've been human's best friend. You've been through a lot, and we've been right there with you. A dog is part of the family, a confidant, and a friend who always knows how to get into your heart. So what happens to our beloved companions when we can no longer care for them? This is why we've created Dante's Den an innovative, state-of-the-art facility that will provide care for up to 100 dogs. Dante's Den is a community for joyful dogs.
Millions of Americans face uncertainty when planning for the future of beloved pets who may well outlive them. Dante's Den is a charitable organization. So in whatever capacity you can, please lend your support so that we may continue this most wonderful work. Dante and I would like to thank you for watching and for also opening up your hearts to our wonderful community of joyful dogs. Learn about the many ways you could become involved by visiting dantesden.org. Welcome back. You know, Zeus, here on Animal Outtakes, we are committed to the care of all animals, big and small just like you. We recently visited the Panther Ridge Conservation Center and featured a segment about the center then and now. There is so much happening with their big cats, so we wanted to show you even more. Take a look. Sadie, today we have wandered onto a piece of heaven. Yeah. Right here in Wellington, Florida. And these magnificent cats that are behind us. How did you get interested in the exotic cats? So um, after college, I actually started with a seasonal zoo zookeeping position. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with animals. And I started doing internships with exotic felines uh, for the past two and a half years and I actually traveled to Florida uh, for this position. That says a lot about Panther Ridge, where they have several types of big cats Sadie gets to work with. At Panther Ridge, we have 17. And what do they consist of? We have anything from a jaguar to a cougar, to a caracal, to a serval, uh, clouded leopards, um, ocelots, Duma. And Duma. we were about to meet several of them. This is Duma and Phoebe, Serval and Caracal. Hey guys! So this is Phoebe, that's Duma. And of course the ears are what draws attention immediately. Yep. So these are both rescues. Duma was someone's um, pet. They left him behind an exotic pet store. Um, and a customer knew about Judy and brought him here when he was two. He's 18 now. Many of the cats here have a similar backstory. Phoebe was another pet that a breeder owned, and as she started growing, they no longer wanted her and gave her to Panther Ridge. Although servals and caracals are both from Africa, they're not necessarily found in the same areas. But these two have formed a special bond with one exception. These guys are best friends, except when food's involved which they think I have. We headed from our African cats to South America, where we were introduced to Bella, one of the two jaguars at Panther Ridge. There's actually less than 15,000 of them left out in the wild. Very endangered. For that reason, they're hoping that Bella and their other jaguar, Mateo, will produce offspring. And that leads us to another endangered cat. This is Macho Man, he's an ocelot. We have four ocelots, so ocelots are endangered as well. They used to be heavily poached for their fur. Their fur is just gorgeous. They have a series of different spots, stripes, and rosettes. And another cat with a striking coat is the clouded leopard. But this is Ming too. He's a clouded leopard. Um, him and his sister were featured on Animal Planet's Growing Up Clouded Leopard TV show. And these two were born at the Nashville Zoo, and they were raised there. And now Ming Tu and his sister May will live out their retirement years at Panther Ridge. But for some of the other endangered or vulnerable big cats, this is more than a retirement center. These cats' native habitats are being just completely destroyed. Uh, there's hardly any wild left, you know, and the only way really that we're going to have to save these species is to maintain a viable population in captivity so the hope that one day you know we can protect some more areas of forests and re-release these cats to do their part panther ridge is preparing to launch a breeding program yet another way to preserve and protect these big cats wildcat populations around the world are diminishing due to a decrease in their natural habitat Find out more about what you can do to help by visiting the Panther Ridge website. Learn about research projects you can support. 
don't purchase exotic or endangered woods or non-sustainable products from other countries. And remember, exotic cats never make good pets. There are a lot of things you can do to protect and preserve. And now on to another one of our favorite segments, VI Pets. And this week, we got to meet not one, but four gentle giants who will steal your heart faster than they can clear their food dish. Let's take a look. This is, over here's Lola, who's the oldest. She's eight years old. She was born in Florida. And this is Lola's sister, who's seven, and this is Jasmine. She was also born in Florida. They're a year apart. This is Willow. She, say hey. Willow is five years old. She was born in Virginia. And this is Bronson the baby, he's three. And he was born in South Carolina. Okay. <laughs> That's the corn. They're gentle giants. They're very, very easy going dogs. Very stubborn too, because they're... Um, half bulldog and half mastiff. And so the block headedness comes from the bulldog. <laughs> and the size and the temperament pretty much comes from the mastiff. Give me five, give me five. <gasps> I had a little health uh, problems a couple years back and Beth thought I should get a dog. So we got Lola and Lola's sp very special to me because she helped me through that hard time. She, she basically rehabilitated him. They're your best friend. They're, they know, they're so intuitive. They know when you need to be just just need to have somebody near you. They know when they can be funny with you. They're really, they, they're just really uh, completely devoted unconditionally. Every time one got out of the puppy stage, I missed it. And he wanted only one. I'm the one that wanted to keep going. And they do sleep up on the bed and actually they give us plenty of room. They, we lay down and then they inch in. And they're very quiet and they don't bark. But usually once a day they have like their little meeting, little pack meeting, where uh, Bronson is the leader of the pack and he'll, he'll start this little bark and all four of them will start howling. And uh, it's something to hear. They take a nap to prepare to take a nap for the nap that they're going to take. It's taught me about true true love and true friendship and they don't care what you look like they don't care if you're sad or if you're happy they're always there and it makes me want to be a better person being around them no oh, there we go those are some very special dogs and very dedicated owners as well up next a course in agility these athletic competitors go all out to prove who's best, and they love every minute of it. We'll be right back.
This week, we have a special dog of the week for you, or should I say, dogs of the week. We stopped by a great agility competition and we found some amazing athletes. Check this out. Dog agility has become a very popular sport. It involves a handler directing a dog through an obstacle course without any food, toys, or incentives of any kind. Just the desire to do well. Boxer brothers Rocky and Oliver are good examples of dogs with desire. These are incredibly faithful dogs. They may not be the fastest dogs out there. You know, the Border Collies and others are faster. But as far as uh, uh, wanting to please and work for you, this is a working breed dog. So they really try, you know, their darndest to, to work for their owners. And uh, they're very, I will say they're very logical. They can actually analyze situations and work around them. In some cases, that's to a disadvantage. Courses consist of a variety of obstacles, including A-frames, dog walks, seesaws, or teeter-totters, tunnels, hurdles, weaves, and much more. Dogs are scored on several values and faults, although I'm not sure that they're aware of that. They just seem to be having fun, young and old. We've seen them compete all the way to their, their latter years of nine or ten years old, um, uh, some even longer. But, uh, as long as they're healthy and they're enjoying themselves? That's exactly right. Age may not be as much of a factor as, well, calorie intake. I think weight is very critical. I think some folks can maybe overfeed a dog and get too much dynamic stress on the limbs and the shoulders, and it can be detrimental. These guys are barrel chested, which means they have a lot more mass in their chest. So they have to be preserved as far as how they land, especially coming off of the A-frame or some of the other objects that move. And some dogs are just great competitors. He's um, number two boxer in the United States for agility. Um, we're going to the Invitationals in Orlando um, next month. So we'll see how good she does. She likes it. She's a little rocket boxer. She's fast, um, she's agile, and she loves doing it. The dogs do seem to love it, and that's what really matters. And you know, the owners seem to enjoy it too. So it's a win-win for all. Here's an interesting fact. In agility, dogs are not separated by breed. They are divided into smaller groups based on size, age, and experience. Given some time and encouragement, even a timid dog can gain confidence through agility. Go ahead. It's time to see the doctor. Doctor Dog, that is, with this week's tip. Don't go away. And now it's time to head over to Dr. Anne Chauvet. This week, 
she gives us some advice on what to expect in case of an emergency. So coming to an emergency room is something very, very stressful because you are coming usually not at a time that is convenient for you. You may have taken time off work. It's the middle of the night. Perhaps you couldn't go to that party that you booked. Either way, it's stressful. You don't have your records. Your pet is sick, vomiting, and some stranger, probably someone who just got out of school, is trying to tell you that you're going to be spending $500 to $800 to begin the workup. Well, here's a story. When you come in, we have to assume the worst for your pet. That is our job. We want to make sure that your pet is safe and that we don't go into the minimum mode because it could be so quickly costing you a life, your pet's life. So we're going to automatically usually recommend the basics and the basics in an emergency room include the exam, radiograph of abdomen or chest depending on the problem, and blood work it is very difficult for us to play the guessing game. So we definitely want to be sure of what we're dealing with. Then after that, we'll come back to you and let you know. If you come to us and tell us that your pet ingested some rat poison, for example, then we're simply going to take your pet away from you and begin working very, very fast. So when we come out and we serve you a bill of $800, it's very scary, but we also usually give you a pet back. The other thing you need to be ready for is go to your ERs ahead of time. It sometimes feels like we have no bedside manners, but you have to understand we live a life of crisis. So we have to be ready for everything. And sometimes manners are not the first thing we're going to put on the table. It's got nothing to do with who we are, but how much we care and love those pets of yours. So go to the local ER clinics, interview them, visit them, walk through the hallways and see how things work, preferably on a calm day where they're not too crazy, and then get an opinion, find out what they're going to charge, find out how they would process the animals. They are some subtle differences, but you need to be an educated owner. Great advice from the doc. And you know what, Zeus? We've done it again. Another great show. We hope you've had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. So until next week, I'm Marsha Panucci, and thanks for joining us on Animal Outtakes. She wants my attention. She's just pulling my hand in a little bit of sweat. Yeah. See? Over here is, this is a little trivia, a picture of uh, Sylvester Stallone and Butkus. Butkus is Willow's great uncle. So, yes, we put it. There.